Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country and around the world, um, visitors and residents of New York City and Battery Park City, welcome to Angry Americans and a very, very special conversation with the great Errol Lewis. Thank you. Thanks very much. It is really a pleasure and honor to have you here. Um, one week ago, you and I were on live TV as uh, American military bases were being bombed in Iraq. So this is a nice change. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And you've, you've always been a, good, uh, a, a great guest and a good sport and uh, come out to help when on my show on New York One, we need somebody with some real expertise who's a real New Yorker who actually will show up on time. I try. In the military, if you're on time, you're five minutes late. There you go. So, um, but I think, you know, every, every episode of, my, of this show, I want to interview someone who is an important, iconic, and or inspiring American. Someone who has shaped what America was, what it is, and what it will be. And, and you're smack dab in the middle of all of it. And so many of us in New York, and I think increasingly around the country, look to you to be a, a voice of wisdom and a voice of clarity. But... Taking a step back, tonight is the debate in Iowa. Yes. You just finished a show. What's a day like for Errol Lewis? Oh, boy. Um, like, like many other parents, um, I'm up to get my kid uh, out the door. And um, we walk over to the bus stop. It's pretty much the only time I'm guaranteed to have with him alone every day. Um, so that's, that's a very nice part of the day. Um, from seven to nine, if I'm really on my game, I'm doing some writing or I'm doing some, some other kind of stuff. Uh, we have our first show meeting at 10 a.m. just to check in, see what's going on in the world. Presumably, I've read all my papers and am up on things by then. Uh, and, you know, at, at that point, the day takes shape. But uh, my TV show, Inside City Hall, it, a part of it is taped but most of it is live at 7 p.m. So everything is kind of building up to 7 p.m. Everything kind of works backwards from that. Um, I have a few hours to do things like, you know, laundry and, the, you know, go into the store. I do our food shopping for my house, um, get to the gym if I'm lucky, that sort of a thing. My wife usually works from home, so we have lunch uh, together a lot of the time. Uh, but sooner or later, you know, you got to get to work. And um, starting in the early afternoon, we start really putting shape to things. I'm almost always working on preparation for something else. As you know, I have a, a handful of jobs. So I have the TV show every day, but I have a, a newspaper column that comes out in the Daily News every Thursday. So in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, okay, what's the next column going to be? Um, I have a podcast called You Decide, which comes out every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and there's usually some need to talk with producers and make sure we've got uh, all of that together. Some of it, we take elements from the show, but mostly we don't. Um, so there's always something to do. Next semester, or I should say starting in a few weeks, I'll be teaching. I teach once a year at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. Um, and uh, that's something I've been doing for the last nine years. And that always takes some work when there are, are kids who are turning in stories and looking for guidance. And so, so there's always, you know, that kind of stuff goes on. But then pretty much around four o'clock, five o'clock, it's just the show. And there's always preparation for the show. My rule of thumb is, it's, I've just noticed it over the years, that I'm putting in about five or ten minutes worth of preparation for every minute that's on the air. So a typical interview, like the one that you came in to do with me, I think we were on for about 12 minutes. Um, that's, you know, that's a little over an hour's worth of prep, you know, bare minimum. You know, read about it. What are we, you know, what are we doing? What's the latest? What are the arguments? What is the guest, what has the guest said or written what are, what are the, the important elements to get to, you know, and the, the point of all of it is to make it look kind of easy, like you just wandered in off the street. And we're like, oh, hey, Paul's here. Let's talk about what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, when in reality, you know, I was taught by one of my um, mentors, the only spontaneity we want is planned spontaneity. Mm. You know, we want it to look easy. We want it to look natural. We want it to look like, you know, you just happen to be sitting around reading about uh, you know, uh, for foreign policy, but the reality is that's that's the essence of the work. Now, you grew up in Nourishell. Yes. Just outside the city. Yep. And went to Harvard. 
Correct. where did you start your journalism career or your journalistic aspirations at Harvard or where did that come from? Okay. How did you, how and when did you decide this is what you wanted to do with your life? A, l- a little bit of an arc. We actually started out in uh, the projects in West Harlem in the Manhattanville projects. My dad was an NYPD officer and um, we moved to New Rochelle when I was in second grade. And so I think of that as where I grew up, but it is part of our family story and my memory that, you know, we lived in a very different place before we got to the suburbs. Um, I, I went to uh, college. I went to Harvard thinking I was going to do some writing. I didn't know that political science even existed until I was halfway through the interview process. And I was like, oh, I could just deal with the politics. That's great. I was going to be an English major or something just so I'd have an excuse to write about something. And I knew I was going to write about politics. Uh, and then to find out that they had... Uh, a newspaper, the Harvard Crimson, which is separate from the university, is well endowed, has its own building, its own printing press, and a, a storied history. Past editors at the paper include, you know, FDR and, you know, John F. Kennedy and, and people like that, uh, as well as, you know, most of the masthead of the New York Times in any given year. Uh, and so it was, it was the natural place to go. And it's older kids train younger kids. It is still, you know, one of the parts of the magic of journalism is that you don't need a license. You know, you don't need a degree. There is no journalism major at Harvard, for example. You just go and you put in enough time. And if somebody pays you to write a news story, then you're a journalist. And um, the older kids would would teach the younger kids. So I worked with uh, Paul Engelmeyer, who's now a federal judge, and Jeffrey Tubin, who you know from CNN. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Tubin's year included... Tubin, Nick Kristoff, and David Sanger. Um, you know, these, these were the kind of people who were hanging around the yeah, building. Lightweights. Yeah, lightweights. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, but we, we, were, we all learned this stuff together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I go back and look at old stories that I wrote. And even back then, this is the early 80s, I was solidly hooked on local stuff. And I go back and read stories. I can't even believe, I can't believe my name is on it. And it's like reading a foreign language where I'm covering the Cambridge City Council and the ins and outs of the, you know, the infighting between these, these local politicians. But that's really what I was always into. Now, we are at the Battery Park City Association, and I want to thank them again for hosting us today. And unlike at New York One, we can enjoy a mocktail. <laughs> uh, we are enjoying a mocktail, but I usually ask our guests as one of the first questions so we can get to know you. What is your, your cocktail or adult beverage of choice, Errol Lewis? Yeah, you know, I, I, I know that you do that. And I was thinking, does it say anything essential? Because I think of it as a seasonal question, right? I mean, if this was July, I'd say gin and tonic, right? But it's not July. So I'm in, uh, I'm in um, whiskey sour season. And whiskey sour is what I would reach for if we were at a bar right now. This is why I'm always glad I asked that question. <laughs> I, I never would, would have, would, could have imagined what you have chosen, but that's not what I would have picked. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's a fantastic, fantastic choice. Yeah. Especially I mean, it, it, and hopefully at a nice bar where they actually use egg whites for the sour mix, you know, that, the, the good stuff. So another question we ask of all our guests, when you were growing up um, in the city and in New Rochelle, Errol Lewis, what was your first car? Uh, my first car was when I got out of college because I never had a car and I was, I'm the old, the old, I was at the younger end of my age cohort. So other kids drove me around when I was in high school because I wasn't, I was nowhere near the, the right age. But um, my first car was a Hyundai in 1986. It was the first year they started selling Hyundais in America. It was new enough that if you saw somebody else in a Hyundai, you would honk and wave at them. <laughs> um, uh, I had the very first Hyundai. It was a stick shift. I don't even think they make them anymore. And uh, I smashed it up pretty good on um, I-95 North right outside of Greenwich. Um, had it rebuilt and um, drove it into the ground. It was the wow. greatest car I ever had. I, I, I still wish I had a stick shift. And what color was it? It was blue. You can't find them anymore. What you kind can't. of a blue? Um, I, I, would, I guess you would call it like a cobalt blue. It was kind of a darkish blue, you know, a little, a little lighter than what you've got on. You're, you're wearing navy. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, it was, it was a sturdy car, man. It got me where I needed to go. And... I, I, look, when I got out of college, I came, to, I came to Crown Heights 
it was a, a house that my father had bought in the 1950s. The last tenants had moved out. There were literally crack vials on the steps, and I sweat the crack vial. It's a broken window. I got the window repaired. Cats were living in the house. I had to chase the cats out. It was the greatest, greatest thing in the world to have like a place to stay in New York City. Horrendous crime. Horrendous, horrendous crime. This is 1985. But I had a car and a press pass. And, you know, I, and, and a computer. And I had the world at my feet. You know, I mean, it was, it was, the, it was, it was I wouldn't have traded it for anything. And you were on the radio and you were uh, an editor at The Sun. Well, on this, the editorial board at The Sun later, the, fast forward, right? I, well, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a fast forward. Very I mean, fast when forward. I, when I first got out of college, I, I turned down an offer from the Wall Street Journal and went to work for like a community rag on Jerolamon Street in Brooklyn because I wanted to cover the city, not, you know, the world of finance. Um, the, the New York Sun started in 2002, and I had something in the first edition. The editor was uh, Seth Lipsky, who was a, a personal friend and a mentor. He'd help, actually helped me get a summer internship um, long before in the 1980s um, at the Wall Street Journal, as a matter of fact. And um, he had, was, at the time, he was the foreign editor of the, of the Wall Street Journal. And um, it, was, you know, it, was a, it was a great experience. It was a conservative newspaper. Uh, I was writing editorials. I was writing columns. I was writing news stories, sat in on editorial board meetings. That's where I met my now wife. Um, it was a great, great experience. And some, somebody at some point is going to write the story of all the people who came through the New York Sun. There's a, a vast number of really talented, very successful journalists who all kind of came through there. It's um, Seth Lipsky's um, superpower is um, finding and nurturing talent in the, in the field. And there are a number of reasons why I'm excited to talk to you now, Errol. But um, I think as I've watched the 2020 race unfold, New York has almost become a default primary state in that the media center here, the finance center here, how many candidates come here to raise money. But there are also interesting personal connections to so many of the different candidates. Cory Booker is from just across the river. Kristen Gillibrand was running. Andrew Yang is from New York. Bernie Sanders was born in Brooklyn. Trump, of course, is from New York. There are probably others I'm, I'm missing. That's right. But the candidates might spend as much time here as in any other primary state. Well, that's right. I mean, and it's, you know, partly through happenstance, like the coincidences that you're describing, but also because they come through here a lot just to pick up money, right? It's, a bit, it's the fundraising capital. You know, every year somebody does a story on the top zip codes for donors to the various major candidates. And, you know, two or three of those zip codes are here in Manhattan. Um, they know and rely on and use the city like an ATM, uh, but also because of where we fall, we're falling in the middle of sort of late April and under the new rules, especially after what happened in 2016, the race will almost certainly not be decided on the Democratic side. Who the, the Democratic nominee will be, I expect it to be, there'll, there'll probably be a favorite, but the outcome will not be a foregone conclusion by April. Meaning, which, and the good news is that means all of us who are Democrats get to really sort of participate. Um, and it, it, was, it, it was true four years ago in a big, big way when Bernie Sanders was essentially making his last stand in New York, which for a Brooklyn boy made sense. Um, and Hillary Clinton, who had her own, has her own ties, to, of course, to New York and had represented the state, um, put up a ferocious battle. But it was really interesting and kind of nice to be in contention. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever been on the campaign trail. When you go to Iowa, you go to New Hampshire. It's just, I mean, it's outrageous. The, the, they are so spoiled. They expect every single candidate to come, not to the state, but to come to their library, their town, their diner, walk over to them. They're not going to get up and walk across the diner. The candidate needs to come over and shake their hand and tell them something. Um, New Yorkers, you know, we've never gotten that kind of treatment, but it was nice to have candidates crisscrossing the state, even on the Republican side. John Kasich came here, remember? He went up to Arthur Avenue and was shoveling food in his mouth as fast as he could, (laughs) trying to do, you know, what he could to pick up some delegates. And you moderated the debate? Did you? I was a a questioner. 
on, in, in April of 2016 in the final debate between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. That was an epic clash at it the was, time. It was unbelievable. Can you take us inside that oh, night dude, yeah, and no what idea. that was like for you? Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, first of all. And you got to keep in mind, I've been doing, I've been moderating debates of one kind or another for every low level, you know, I mean, you know, assembly and city council and you know, congressional races. I've probably done well over a hundred at this point. And, you know, if you, <laughs> if you remember uh, the early part or of the, of the movie Gladiator, right, where he's out in the provinces and these, these horrible little sand pits, you know, fighting, <laughs> fighting people to the death. And then he comes to Rome. This was like coming to Rome, you know? Uh, and, and the big surprise was, it was a lot like those, those scraps in church basements that I'd been dealing with for the previous 20 years. It was a loud, raucous, um, you know, you could see that Clinton and Sanders were getting on each other's nerves. The, the dislike was genuine at this, that point, I would say. The stakes were fairly high. The room was very noisy. I felt right at home. It was a great debate. It was a great debate. So I had the unique opportunity to host and help create the Commander in Chief Forum during that same oh, that time was awesome. period. Right? That was awesome. So yeah. we had uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump together on the Intrepid the week before 9-11 in New York to focus on national security and veterans issues. And I got a crash course on all of it. I mean, on, on, you know, they, they couldn't be in the same room. Right. Who was on the ship at what? And it was literally a ship, which made it that much more complicated and interesting. <laughs> but, but that was a fascinating um, a planning process yes. to see how it was kind of a four-sided uh, discussion and planning process between us, Iraq and Afghanistan, Veterans of America was the host. Then we had NBC, which was broadcasting then each of the campaigns. Right. And for example, moderators could be rejected or accepted. Formats could be rejected and accepted. And that unfolded and it ended up being the first time and the last time they were together before the first debate. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I, I share that in part because uh, I wish I had more influence in the end over how that unfolded. You know, I feel I mean, the same way. Right, the, the, there, there were questions you wanted to ask that, that never well, got asked. And right? even, for example, a controversial issue became that Gary Johnson was not included. Yeah. And I caught a lot of shit. We caught a lot of shit for, for, for excluding Gary Johnson from the stage. We didn't exclude Gary Johnson. NBC did. Right. And right. the candidates did. They all, oh, you know, NBC said Gary Johnson's going to kill ratings. Right. And neither Donald Trump nor Hillary Clinton wanted, wanted Gary Johnson on stage. We were actually one, the only one of that quadrant because uh -huh. he had a, some following in the military and veterans community that pushed for an independent candidate and others to be involved. But right. this takes me to a question, which is, Errol, you know, we're watching these debates. There's going to be a few more in the next couple of weeks. Iowa's right around the corner. If you were designing a debate, mm in the best interest of the public, mm. and you are someone that I think always has the public interest in mind, and I watched probably half of the, at least half of the debates that you did moderate, the ones in Staten Island and all the others, mm -hmm. but if you were to craft it in the best interest of the public, what would you do? How would you have it? Wow. I, I would consider something radical, like uh, a few years ago in the race for uh, president of France, uh, we got to look at how they do it, and it was just the two candidates. There's no moderator, and they just kind of sat face-to-face -face at a table, and they kind of went at it for, you know, a couple of hours, right? I mean, that's, that's real talk. Um, if, it, if it were up to me, um, we'd, we'd make it long, not open-ended, but long. You know, we did a debate for public advocate, which whatever else you want to say about it, it's not a very powerful position. It can be consequential. It can be meaningful. We, we put on a two-hour debate. You know, we just thought it was the right thing to do. There were a lot of candidates that night. And we said, well, let's, let's go until it's done. We've had producers at a fairly high level um, kill commercials and let us run over the time because we were in the middle of something and it was important. So if, if it were up to me, um, we'd have a good, a good civic panel of journalists and also some outside civic groups. And we we design a format that was going to make sure that there were not questions designed to hit a headline the next day, but were designed to touch on important issues, a good wide range of important issues, and most importantly, give people time to answer the questions. It's, right. my, it's my pet peeve when, you know, you, you tell people, you know, look, time, you, you, you're, you're like a sculpture. You're like a sculptor. And time is the block of granite, right? So you, you've got to work backwards. You've got a two-hour debate. 
You've got X number of, you know, every question and answer is going to take about four minutes. If there are rebuttals, it might take five, it might take six. And, you, you know, you just kind of work it through. So then, then if the question then is, what 12 questions can we ask the next president of the United States or ask in such a way that we're going to determine the next president of the United States? You better pick the right 12 questions. Not silly stuff. Not, you know, do you want to have a dog or a cat in the White House? You know, or not, not um, some obscure feud that happened to be in that news cycle so that you can make sure you're ahead of your news rivals the next day. Both of those things are trivial. What they should really be trying to do is, so that's what I would do. Yeah. I would also give, give the, the, the public some advanced sense, you know, like, I don't see what's wrong with distributing some of your briefing book. You know, before every major debate, I'm, you may have seen it at CNN, they give you this big, thick book, all of this background on all of the candidates and tons of polling and demographic data and electoral history of the area that you're talking about and so forth. You should give this to the public. You should give this to the public. Like, let's, let's treat people like adults. Let's try and get everybody educated. You can take a little, you can take a lot of information. And then let's let's treat this like the serious business that it is. That's what that's what I would do. And keep or eliminate live audiences because I've seen some debates where you're, you know, you you look like you're at the Roman Coliseum trying to keep people out of the <laughs> ring. <laughs> you're um, referring to the general. Uh, you're referring to the general election debate for mayor in 2017. I am when yeah. I had to cut off the microphone of Bo Deedle. And I had an audience member thrown out. That was the only time I had to do that. I turned around and pointed to somebody and asked them to like just take the guy. But out. would you? But but serious <laughs> but question. I, I, I would like, you limit? Because I, I find that no. the audience can be disruptive, but also can skew you know the, for the 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 perception of support for folks who stack the room or don't stock the room. Right? I mean, theoretically, Tom Steyer could buy up half the audience now and fill it with. Well, his there, fans. there are ways around that. I mean, normally you give equal numbers of tickets to all right, of the candidates right. and then you'll kind of leave it up to them. But you would keep them. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would. I mean, look, I, you know, we don't want it to be too buttoned down. Right. I mean, you want to let the animal off the chain a little bit, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's not a church picnic. It's a power struggle. Right. I mean, it's, it, and if, if, People say something outrageous, the audience reacts. Sure. Um, you know, as a media producer, you know, you, you can, I mean, I, I try to, I've tried to explain this to disruptive audiences all the time. It's like, if you get up and disrupt it, no one is going to hear it. We will not let that go out over the air. First of all, it won't get picked up by the microphone. And even if it did, we're on a delay. So, you know, your, your great moment will never be seen. There's no point. Um, so with, with that as a backstop, Sure, let people come and cheer and boo. And, you know, as moderator, my job has been to, like, let's keep it to a minimum. Let's keep it reasonable. If somebody tells a joke, yes, it's okay for people to laugh. Um, I've, I've, done, I've done debates both ways, and I like the, the human energy in the room. G given your expertise uh, and your experience in watching Donald Trump among the Democratic candidates, who do you feel is best positioned to face, uh, face him in the debate? Who who is the well, best opposition for him? I in the I, debate. I, I, I'm tempted to just say none of them. You know, I mean, if that's the criteria, if the criteria is, can you stop Donald Trump from doing what Donald Trump does when yeah. he's at the podium? You can't. You can't. Um, you can't. I, I just, you know, he's he's going to do what he's going to do. I mean, if you're, you know, look, you, this is we've we've seen this in action movies our whole lives, right? The good guy is going to sort of play by the rules, right? He's not going to shoot the hostages. He's not going to blow up the whole arena. You know, he's going to try and salvage certain things. And that, of course, is used against him because the bad guy doesn't really care. Bad guy will shoot the hostage at the start of the of the proceedings just to let everybody know. Um, and, you know, Donald Trump, if you if you are a candidate who's going to confine themselves to factual statements um, not using uh, racist epithets like Pocahontas. If you want to have a, a responsible policy that you can actually implement, as opposed to saying we're going to, you know, we're going to give everybody everything, no pre pre existing conditions, you know, that kind of thing. You you are you are fatally disadvantaged if if the question is can you win this debate. Fortunately, it's not about a debate. It's about winning the election. That's a different kind of a task. But um, 
I think whoever the nominee is should expect a really, really rough time on stage with Donald Trump. You have you know, been surrounded by Donald Trump most of your professional career in some way, shape, or form. For folks who are listening from outside of New York and maybe outside of America, can you share your analysis <laughs> of the phenomenon that is Donald Trump? And what should yeah. they know? You know, as a political watcher, you're, you're yeah. maybe the expert well, among look, all I, others I, I in think, his ascension over the last few years. Your, I, your thoughts on that? I, th- I think it's important that people remember. When I, when I think of him, I think of him as a game show host. I don't think of him as a developer. He was a developer early in his career. He left that behind a long time ago. Um, he, when he went to Hollywood, he became closer to the Donald Trump that we see today. And that Donald Trump is a performer. And he is a game show host. I mean, you know, the whole thing about The Apprentice is he sets people against each other. He, you know, kind of undermines people and creates conflict and floats above it as the, as the, the arbiter and the dictator of it. And in the end, he says, this one wins, this one loses, according to whatever criteria, including illegitimate criteria, that he, you know, sometimes it's a whim. I remember seeing one episode of The Apprentice where he, he fired everybody. So you're all fired, you know. And it was it's actually very funny. Um, it's kind of so, like half his cabinet in the last few yeah, years. Yeah, well, there you yeah. go, right? So, so I mean, that's, that's closer to who he is. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it is a decision that we made as a country. You know, I mean, I'll, I, I buy into it like everything else. You know, the, the process was reasonably fair. And this is what we decided. We decided we wanted something that was a radical break with the past out of, you know, 44 prior presidents, Every one of them had served in government in some capacity or in the military. Um, And this was somebody who had never done any of that. Um, All of the others had sort of a track record that you could look at, and that wasn't true here. There was a business track record, but it was a very, very troubled and spotty one. And then there was the sort of uh, the surface illusions, the, the, you know, the sort of uh, the smoke and mirrors of the Hollywood game show host. And that's what people decided the, the country needed. Um, a lot of people felt otherwise. I think we're now seeing a lot of the consequences of that choice. But um, I think what people outside of New York should know is that New Yorkers always knew that this was an act, that the things that Donald Trump purported to have done, he either didn't do or he didn't do it in the way that he described it. You know, things like Trump University came as no surprise to anybody in New York. Um, things like the multiple bankruptcies, you know, the, 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 the Trump princess, this big yacht he used to have docked on the east side. We knew when he bought it, he couldn't afford that thing. Um, the, the, the Taj Mahal, the, you know, the bankrupt casinos, it was all detailed in depth. My favorite story, and I wrote a column about it, which I don't normally do, but I wrote a column telling everybody, read this thing in uh, Bloomberg News. They took 40 40 Wall Street, formerly owned by, you know, Ferdinand Marcos, but ended up in the hands of Donald Trump, the Trump organization. They did this wonderful graphic, and you could click on different suites within it. All of the boiler rooms, the fraud operations, the indictments, the, uh, the people who absconded with other people's money, who went to that building just so they could have a Wall Street address and it helped them with their fraud. And it was, it was astounding that this is what was going on. And this was, you know, this was in 2016. It was put out there for the public. You know, I, I, I accept almost every criticism anybody ever has of the media, but when they say, you didn't tell us about Trump, I kind of draw the line there. It's like, no, 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 no. We told you everything about Trump. <laughs> um, did you ever it, interview it, him, Errol? I did. It was my first field interview. I started at New York One, my first television job, in uh, December of 2010. I went on the air. And in April of uh, 2011, they said, you got to go do a field interview. Go to, you know, 725 Fifth Avenue. You're going to interview Donald Trump. He was talking at the time about running for president. And I was, you know, it's like, okay, sure. Well, I've never been there. You know, I've never been in Trump Tower. And um, we, go, we go up there, and I'm waiting for him, and, and they have you in this waiting room, and it has all of these different little projects. It reminded me of, you know, in the movie Nakatomi Plaza, right? There's all of, these, all of these different hotels that have his name and resorts and stuff. And, you know, like I told you, you always, you always do your homework. So I'm looking at it, and I'm like, 
you didn't build that. You didn't build that. This is a licensing deal. You know, these are some Korean builders who let you put their name on it. And, you know, anyway, so he comes out and, uh, and we, we start talking and I do my usual thing. I want to ask about this. I want to ask about that. He gave me answers that the, the rest of the world has now come to be used to where I'd ask him, so, well, you know, Mr. Trump, you don't have any foreign policy experience. What would you do about, you know, problems in the Middle East, or trade relations. I didn't ask about trade, actually. And he said, I would be very strong on immigration. And then he sat back. And he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, that's the whole answer? You know? And, and, and that was the whole answer. I would be very strong on immigration. Okay. Um, and, and it went like that for about five minutes. And then I say to myself, this is not going anywhere. This, this is not somebody who knows anything about the kind of questions that I want to ask him. So we made it a lot more lighthearted. At that point, and I asked him at the time there was something going on with Charlie Sheen and stuff like that. And I said, Why don't you put Charlie Sheen on The Apprentice? It, it became kind of jokey. Um, and I, I, you know, one, one interesting part about it, I asked him about money. That's one of my sort of just personal rules. I don't know about you, but if I'm ever in a room with a billionaire, I figure, you know, it would be a waste not to ask them about money, <laughs> even if it's at a level of like, you know, can I borrow 20 bucks? You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the many reasons why people love you. You're kind of the people's champion. When you're in the ring, hey. man, we're rooting for you to ask the questions that we would ask. Well, no, I mean, I'm trying to do the interview. You, yeah. you got to connect with people, right. right? So it's like, I'm not going to ask you about your licensing deals because right. that's bullshit. Right. Um, I'm trying to talk to you about government. You're saying you're going to be strong on immigration and then you sit back. So I'm trying to find something. So, so uh, yeah, I asked him a money question. And, you know, I was, you know, was kind of like, um, you know, we all have to deal with our 401ks and things like that. It's like, how do you figure out what to do with, you know, with your cash? And he actually gave an interesting answer. He said, you know, he says, I actually do it myself. I don't use financial advisors. And he, he gave me an interesting story, a little anecdote about in, down there in that Palm Beach circles among all the, the rich people was Bernie Madoff. And that was his hunting ground. That's, that's where he fleeced most of the people that he, he stole from. And um, Trump said he met him and he said to the guy, uh, you know, I don't need your help. I can lose money all by myself, which was true. <laughs> Very good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was an interesting answer. I was an interesting, and, I, and I take him at his word. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. A guy like this who, you know, he may not be as rich as he says, but he's pretty damn rich. And he's got a lot of things going on all over the world. But he chooses to invest his money himself. I thought that was kind of interesting. Definitely. And, and so New York has become a launch pad for him and become a launch pad for people in politics since as long as New York's been around. Um, the one person that we didn't mention in the earlier uh, roster was Mike Bloomberg. So Bloomberg's now in the race. Uh, I think his impact is starting to be felt more than before uh, in ways big and small, ranging from Judge Judy to $10 million Super Bowl ad buys. Yeah. But um, when I was coming to visit your show, Mayor Nutter was back in the green room, who's now, I think, his finance chair or political chair. National right? political National chair. National political yep. chair. And uh, one of the things that I asked him that I can't seem to get a straight answer on is Bloomberg has said repeatedly his goal is to beat Trump. And then he talks about getting elected. And what I've seen about Bloomberg is that he runs the numbers and he has a strategy and executes against it, knowing the probabilities. Yes. And now over the last few weeks, it seems more and more apparent that 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 primary goal is actually his goal. He said that if he loses and doesn't get the nomination, he'll farm out his staff to other staffs. Um, and in many ways, he's maybe the big gun that Democrats have been shitting on in so many ways. He, he's kind of become less popular in the Democratic Party than anybody maybe except Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. Um, but I think now people are starting to see, as always, Bloomberg has a plan. As always, so, Bloomberg has a plan. As so, always. So, so what do you think the influence of Mike Bloomberg is and will be on the 2020 election? Well, look, the, the first thing is that by, by declaring that he, first of all, he has like 800 people on staff now. And I don't think they're done hiring. Quickly. Yeah. 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 Um, he let it be known that they're all going to have jobs and they're all going to be working on the political campaign of one type or another through November. That buys what we saw Bloomberg buy when he was mayor of New York, which is silence, right? Nobody is going to go at him too hard. 
at least not at this phase, not for the foreseeable future. Why? Do you want 800 people working against you? If you're some candidate, you haven't even figured out how you're going to get to Trump at this point. You want an army of 800 coming after you and somebody who has literally, for our purposes, unlimited funds to spend. He's already spent, what, $200 million? More than all of the other candidates combined. It's nothing like this has ever happened before. So he's going to... You know, he won't. He won't get a. He won't get attacked. Um, he he has a plan. It involves skipping the first four contests. I think that that's a very risky strategy. And if if he's going to have a serious stumbling block, I think it will be that. Um, he's buying ads and setting up organizations like crazy in all of the Super Tuesday states in Texas, in California, in North Carolina, and all of these other places that don't go to the polls until uh, March third. Um, I suspect what he's going to run into is that after Iowa, there will be a media roar of the kind that we all remember. I was in Iowa the night that uh, Obama won in 2008. He was about as far away as that window. I was just kind of standing there. And then 10 days later, it was South Carolina. And I was like, you know, they had bomb sniffing dogs. And, you know, it was a whole other thing. I mean, but I remember in Iowa, they, I, you know, they said, Oh, you know, what do you want? I'm with the press. Okay, press, go sit over there. And I was like right over there and watched him give his speech. And so, right. and in, in any event, the, the world changes is my point. The world changes entirely politically. Um, and Bloomberg has a lot of money. The question for me, it's an open question. Uh, you know, nobody knows the answer to this, including Mike Bloomberg. Does he have enough money and organization to counter the media roar that Fox and MSNBC, and CNN, and every local paper, and every local station, they're all going to be talking about who won Iowa. And then a few days later, they're going to be talking about who won New Hampshire. And if either or both of those happen to be Joe Biden, Joe Biden, I think, is on his way to the nomination. Um, Somebody's going to win in South Carolina. It will continue that, you know. So, you know, will there still be a story Out there, will there still be an opportunity for Mike Bloomberg to sort of intervene and scoop up a bunch of delegates in March? I don't know, but he's definitely going to be a factor. And it could be that he's just stockpiling weaponry, political weaponry, to achieve the ultimate goal, which might actually be just to knock out Trump. I right? think he. To, I to, think to, he does want to. Yeah, yeah. to, to yeah. stockpile in the same way he did philanthropically on issues like gun control. You know, he would kind of carpet bomb the the landscape and you know plant a thousand seeds and hope that a couple grow. And, and I think that that's increasingly what it seems like is he wants to bring really big firepower that he can either yield himself or hand off to others. Yes. In 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 the pursuit of that ultimate goal of of knocking him out and being a real annoyance to him. I mean, it's starting to it's starting to hit now. Right? Well, yes, like he's, yes. He's, Trump's reaction yeah. is an indication. And now we've got a different kind of, uh, of escalation of force in that Bloomberg buys a Super Bowl ad, he buys a Super Bowl ad. If he, if he can drain his resources, that, that in and of itself could be a huge advantage to all those against Trump. Well, that, no, it's, it, well, it is interesting. Right? I call it the billionaire beef, you right. know, it, and it's, it's, it's funny as heck. You know, I mean, at, at the Democratic convention, it was an absolute scream to see Bloomberg on stage kind of playing the dozens on Donald Trump, you know, sort of saying, you know, he says he wants to run the country like he runs his businesses, God forbid, you know, and he went on and on and on. Um, You know, just recently, in fact, there was something on Twitter where somebody was talking about um, a battle between the two billionaires and Michael uh, Bloomberg tweets, who's the other one? You know, this is, (laughs) you know, billionaire shade, you know? Um, (laughs) Uh, but but there but there is something to that. He's 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 look. He's got more liquid assets. Let's just let's be kind about it. We don't know because he won't release his taxes. We don't know what Donald Trump really owns. But what he does, we do know that much of his wealth is tied up in real estate deals. Whereas Bloomberg's just got a lot of cash, uh, and that can be converted into commercials and manpower and. Uh, uh, social media ads and all kinds of other stuff uh, instantly as we are now seeing. So this process, Errol, is, I think, extremely frustrating for many folks to watch unfold. For me as a political independent, it's often been frustrating to watch the Democrats kind of eat their own. And we hope that there will be one day this Jon Snow moment from Game of Thrones where they all rally around one tribe and, and come together 
in opposition of the White Walker Night King, right? Um, <laughs> but when you watch this, this process unfold, there's plenty of reason to be angry. And I ask this of, of all our guests, whether it's political or not, Errol Lewis, what makes you angry? Uh, the, you know, look, the things, what makes me angry is when you see people abusing the public trust. You know, uh, I've covered a lot of corrupt politicians over the years. I have been at their indictments. I have been at their trials. I've been at their sentencing. Uh, and it's an endless supply. I told you I've been teaching um, journalism for 10 years. Every year when it comes to the section on corruption, I'm teaching a course on how to cover government. I give them, I'm teaching them how to read an indictment. And I give them the latest indictment of whoever's been, in, you know, I've never had to repeat Right. I mean, there's, there's Sheldon Silver and there's Junior Boyland and there's Malcolm Smith and on and on and on and on. And it never changes. It's human nature. There's no reason to get overly upset about it in a way, you know, just like there are banks, there are going to be bank robbers. There's public money. There will be public corruption. But it, it, it always makes me furious because it's, you know, it's they they steal from people who really 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 need help you know and it, and it's it, you know we you, you can't have a society like that you just you just can't you know and i have a lot of sympathy i'm a good new york liberal so i i tend to have sympathy for the underdog but not for those guys Understanding the environment that trump has created i think you are one of the finest journalists in this country thank you how do you feel about Trump calling you an enemy of the people? And what does it mean for our city, for our country, that we've got a president that continues to refer to people yeah. who I think have the public interest in mind like you, often includes veterans. who I've talked to J James Laporta on this show, who's an investigative reporter at Newsweek, a decorated Marine who covers people killed in action. Trump's talking about him, yeah, right? Trump's talking about you, but... How does that yeah. make you feel, and what does that mean for the larger macro issues we face in the country? It's, it's, it's really important. I mean, look, the, the, his attacks on the press fall into two categories. Some are um, sort of juvenile and sort of obvious. So, like, he attacked me on Twitter. So I was on the list that the New York Times published of people, places, and things that have been attacked by Trump. Showed it to my son. I was a big hero. It was great. <laughs> he, he, he called into CNN. He used to do this. I was on with, um, with uh, Chris Cuomo when he was doing the morning show, and Trump called in and starts attacking me by name. You know, Errol Lewis has been very unfair to me, and da 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 da, da. And that, that wasn't cool either, but I didn't really care. Um, enemy of the people is something else. And I, I just, look, I have a healthy, healthy respect for history and when history is looking you in the face and screaming to you, we have seen this before, you have to take it seriously. So, you know, all of the, there are any number of scholars and some journalists have sort of amplified the work where if there's an authoritarian checklist where democracies are sliding into authoritarianism, one of them is, you know, attacking the independent institutions that are supposed to speak for the people and provide facts and truth uh, in a democracy. And that's precisely what he's doing. It's extremely dangerous. It's extremely problematic. Um, I, you know, I also, though, as a, as a journalist, I recognize the limits of what I can convince people of. You know? So you know, th there are any number of instances in history where the, the truth was blaring and staring the public in their face, and the public either didn't notice or decided they didn't care. And a certain number of people in the public have decided they either refuse to notice or they don't care. And we just kind of have to live with that. We have to live with that. I, 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 overall, I am very confident in our institutions. I think, you know, the courts, the Congress, the people, you know, the elections, the media. I think my colleagues have done a great job. This um, ongoing newspaper war between the walls, I mean, between uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post is like a glory, I know, I mean, not, I'm saying this not just because I know a lot of the people and they're my friends, but it's a glorious moment in journalism. Really they're is, doing yeah. unbelievably, astoundingly good and important work. Uh, I trust that when the smoke settles, 
possibly in November, possibly sooner, possibly a little later, possibly four years from now, when the dust settles, I think the country will go back to something closer to what we would have called normal before 2016. When the dust settles in 2020, we'll have a race for mayor here in New York City. Oh, it's on. It's already happening. And, and that has obviously national implications, maybe more than ever before. You, I think, continue to have de Blasio on every week yes. in a really unique format, something I wish we could get for the president. You know, every week he comes from the gym or wherever he is and sits with you and gets hard questions. Um, but I think that's been a very important public service. But now the landscape is unfolding. Um, there is a, a new landscape continuing on full where somebody like AOC, right, has, has a national, international level um, visibility. Andrew Yang could decide after he drops out that he wants to run for mayor. Corey Johnson, so many others. Can you, can you lay out your assessment of the current field and sure. what do you think the mayoral race looks like next year? R- right now, the top four, meaning the four that we know are running and have served in government long enough that you can expect that they're going to do this and they have opened accounts and so forth. Ruben Diaz Jr., the Bronx Borough President, uh, the city controller, Scott Stringer, uh, the Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams, and the Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson. There's a, that's the core four. There are a handful of others who are talking about it. They're outside of government right now. Um, but one or two of them may in fact run like somebody like the Andrew Yang, the wild cards, um, of those four, they, they have long track records. They all, I've known all of them since they got elected, since before they got elected, I've known three of the four bef- since before they got elected to any office. So it's kind of hard to talk about them without sort of, you know, thinking about their arc from, you know, owning a bar or working in the police department or whatever it was they were doing before. Um, I think we're going to be fine, but it has to be all of us. Like, cause you know, the, the instinct is to ask, well, what about these candidates? But that's sort of like um, the restaurant menu model where like, okay, here's, here's what the guy is offering you. And if you want to pick this, then you want this candidate. It doesn't really work that way. They are, um, they are blank slates to a certain extent, you know, and I've been telling activists and I would tell everyone in this room, everyone listening to your podcast, find these candidates and tell them what they should do if they get elected. Most of them care about like two or three things, maybe five. Um, but everything else, they don't have a position on, you know, how to do seawall protection for Battery Park City. They've never thought about it. They don't know and they don't care. Uh, if you have a problem here with, you know, some imbalance between the seniors and the kids or the tourists who I, I hear keep wandering up here from Battery Park and making everybody's life miserable, they don't know anything. They don't know anything that you don't tell them. You have to tell them. And you have to tell them on, on, on topics that you would think they knew. Because some of them have been in government for a long time and you think they would know these things. They don't know. And, and, and that's okay, but we have to really educate them. So I, I turn into Professor Lewis when I'm interviewing these people, and I kind of tell them, it's yeah. like, this is going to be on the final exam. And, and Professor Lewis did not give us an answer to that question, really, <laughs> about the, the mayoral candidates. So I'll ask you very directly, mm-hmm. Errol, would you ever run for mayor? I would have to be very, very rich and very, very bored, and I am neither. <laughs> if you ran right now, I venture to say you would be polling at the top of that heap. Um, you know, and it's it's not outside the room. You ran. You haven't, this, you, you you, haven't you, seen my oh, hate mail. N- no, but but he, <laughs> look at Trump's hate mail. Has it stopped him? You ran for city council. You, I you did. Ran for city council. Nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Democratic candidate for city council in the thirty fifth district. Now represented by Lori Cumbo. Um, it was a great race. It was the most fun I ever had on a campaign. For anybody who's ever worked on a campaign, being the candidate is the best job. Um, it, I. I put my heart and soul into it. I left everything on the field. I had no backup plan because at the time I was young and stupid and psychologically thought I didn't need to have a backup. And so I was like jobless and the car got repossessed. It was awful. Um, but but uh, but it was it was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. And I want to and, and not for me. I discovered yeah. it was like, you know, this is not for me. <laughs> but I want you to tell the story. It was interesting that I read your transition from candidate to journalist. You you ranked third. 
and then had a unique responsibility with regard to the two candidates ahead of you later. Oh, wait, please. I came in second. Please. Oh, so, so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Correct me, please. I ran, I ran, please, against, thank you. I guess, I ran against Mary Pinkett. Nobody here under 50 knows who Mary Pinkett was, but she was the first African-American woman ever elected to the city council. She'd been there for 23 years. And I figured, well, we'll just, you know, move her out the way and, you know, proceed to a glorious destiny. Um, the voters thought otherwise. I came in second. The person who came in third was James Davis, who later became a close friend. And um, I was with his mother at the hospital after he was assassinated at City Hall. And that experience, more than anything else, finished that chapter for me. You know, because people said, oh, now you can run, you know, because he, he eventually went on and became the city council member. Term limits kicked in. Mary Pinkett retired. James Davis ran. And people came to me and said, oh, you know, now's your time. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I went to law school. He got assassinated inside City Hall by a political rival who wanted to run for the seat. And people were calling me like within a day or two. Oh, now's your chance. Now your chance. And, and I'm like, I actually drew the opposite conclusion, you know. <laughs> <laughs> from this experience that I'm completely done. And yes, it is, it's, it's macabre and it's, it's not funny at all, but I mean, but it happens to be true is, you know, very few people in politics get the chance to write the obituary of their opponents, which I did in both the case of, Mary, of them, right? Mary Pinkett and James Davis, um, that 1997 race. Yeah. Every, everybody's gone from that race. My campaign manager passed away from back then. It's, mm. it's, it's dead and buried. It's over. But your candidacy may not be. The people would, would get behind Errol Lewis. If you, <laughs> if you or Brian Lair you know. ran for mayor of New York, <laughs> I think you'd see a tremendous groundswell of support. And I, I just ask that you consider it in, 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 on behalf of the people of New York City. There's definitely nobody who I've ever met who knows more about New York City well, you were, than you, you do. You were, you were very kind. You haven't met my wife. Um, which is where any such talk would start and end. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, there, you know, look, there, there are a lot of ways to contribute. And as, as I've told people, you know, because they say, oh, why don't you run for this or run for that? It's like, look, there's 51 members of the city council. There's only one host of mm. Inside City Hall, you know. It's so, true. Right? And, true. and, and which is important, uh, you know, in a way that um, I don't want to be cocky about it, but um, they come and they go and we stay, right. you know, I mean, when we go to the democratic convention in Milwaukee, it's going to be my ninth convention. Presidents come and go, you know, and we stay. And that's important for all of us, I think, to recognize that, that, um, you know, I was talking with, he's a wonderful guy. I get to interview him a couple of times a year when he's promoting a film. Um, but when Ken Burns came in last time I was talking to him, I asked him, like, what do you make of all of this stuff, this craziness, the impeachment and everything else? And he said, you know, the country's kind of lost its mind. You know, I mean, that's my words, not his. He said, you know, <laughs> FDR said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, you know, JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And Trump said, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not lose any support, you know. And, and what his point was, you know, the guy who's an operator who can kind of go outside the lines and get away with it, it captured something in the American soul or spirit in such a way that a lot of people react to that. And, you know, over time, I tend to believe that we'll come to our senses, we'll put that aside, we'll reach for, you know, better, better things. You know, the notion that you put a clean glass of water in a dirty glass of water, sooner or later, the kid will figure out which one they should be drinking from. Hmm. You, you, your response there, Errol, is part of why people love you. You bring a tenacity and an optimism and a passion and a curiosity, right, that, that kids growing up in this city um, bring. And, and if it's harnessed, they can go on to do great things. And you're a role model for so many of them, somebody who came up in the city and now has this tremendous platform that's doing good. Um, at its core... Errol Lewis, what makes you happy? Ah, oh, um, I I am actually this is this work with me on this. What makes me happy? What I really really like is talking with older people who are in and around government, politics, and journalism. 
they, to me, first of all, they're modeling kind of where I'm heading. So it's nice to see that you can sort of um, retire from this game in dignity and, and still be useful and interesting. But there is so much wisdom and so much passion and caring and experience just within the five boroughs. I mean, pe- people out there, I mean, you know, we, we just had this big battle to close Rikers Island, the biggest, uh, the big jail, the big, the central jail for New York City. Uh, it's disgraceful, problematic on multiple, multiple levels. But there's this guy named Herb Sturz, who's often described as a, a, a sort of a civic treasure, which he is, who tried to do this in 1970. And he still shows up. I remember speaking at a conference and I'm looking out in the audience. There's Herb Sturr still showing up, trying to, you know, not, not um, browbeating people, not doing the, the crotchety old man thing about back when I was right, trying to right. do, but, but just there and available. That stuff makes me really, really um, satisfied. You know, him, um, David Jones, who runs the Community Service Society, Guys who have, you know, been around the sun a few times and have seen the city when it was falling apart. I just did an interview with um, Norman Steisel. He was the first deputy mayor under Dinkins, but he had also worked in the budget division under Lindsay. Um, The late Jay Kriegel passed away recently. He was a good friend. Um, I love those guys. I mean, they they are a link to the past. They are um, sort of a, a path for the rest of us to sort of unlock and understand this confusing city, absolute civic jewels. And um, I'm always happy to talk to them, including my dad, retired uh, inspector, Edward Lewis. Great, great guy. And, you know, the war stories alone are worth hearing, but like a perspective on, on the world and on the city that has convinced me that, you know, in the end, yeah, I think we are going to be okay. You know, in part because these guys told me. Mm-hmm. You give us that hope, I think, every day and every night. And I, I know the city is very proud of you. And I hope that this next year especially can elevate your profile even higher across this country because it's a voice that needs to be heard and a perspective that needs to be understood and felt. A final um, tradition we have on this show on Angry Americans is the giving of the gifts. So in a minute for folks in the room, we're going to take questions of Errol. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, we are very grateful for you. Oh, and I have a giving of the oh, gifts. Cool. There are three traditional gifts. Uh huh. And done here? the first are some American-made Angry Americans swag, some shirts. Oh, okay. So like when that. you're feeling like angry, that. you can put that shirt on. Made angry. by veterans at, at Oscar Mike. Okay. Cool. And then you can clap for them. Sure. I think everyone, I want to. Every, I'm, everyone loves veterans. And then the next, uh, the next item we've got, Errol, mm-hmm. is this. We started the show around Easter, and this is a question and a gift. Oh boy. So every guest that we've ever had in the show is chosen. There are three colors of peeps, pink, <laughs> pink, yellow, and blue. Which color would you choose, oh Earl, and why? God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. I would choose, I will choose um, pink because I am not going to eat any of these. I am going to give them to my wife and son, and I think they might like these the best. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, so it's just pure sugar. They're delicious. <laughs> and lastly, also d- delicious and ne- unique to New York, we always have a, uh, an American-made whiskey um, that we, oh, we give to each guest. And we have, That's the real candy. Uh, have to find one that has specific significance to our guest. Mm-hmm. And this is Fort Hamilton whiskey. Oh, I like Which that. is actually made in Brooklyn. They brew that down in, and, by the bridge. They, yeah, How about that? They make it in oh, Brooklyn. look at that. And that is our, our gift to you oh, to enjoy. Oh, uh, yes. Along with your peeps. Uh, and and anyone else after the you ever have a drink with de blasio afterward no no he, he's gone I, I, I have had i have had uh i have broken bread with him yeah and um you know i look i i met i met de blasio in 1989 he was the volunteer coordinator for the the david dinkins campaign he's the lowest ranking member of the campaign and um i was a volunteer so i would you know i'd go to times square the whole thing was so like picturesque and almost bizarre they were in this building on 43rd Street. Um, and you remember, there were a lot of adult establishments there. This wasn't, you know, they shared space, not with a porno theater, but with a porno studio where they were making the porn. Yeah. Um, it was a pretty wild campaign. 
Um, <laughs> and he was, he had exactly the right sense of humor about everything related to that. Um, and neither of us really thought that Dinkins was going to win. And, it, and, you know, lo and behold, he did and changed the city. And, um, but uh, I, I, look, I, I, I think the mayor is somewhat misunderstood. The, the point being, I think that history is partly why he comes on the show every week. He knows, I know him since before he met his wife. He knows me since before I met my wife. Um, we kind of came out of the same political milieu uh, of a city that has now vanished. And um, he wants what's best for the city. You know, you may not agree with this or that. And some of the criticism, I think, is frankly trivial, like what time he shows up at the office. I'm much more interested in what he does when he gets there. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, he's... He's going to he's going to go down as one of the better mayors. You think so? I I am sure of it. I am sure of that it. That we might have to pick up in a future podcast. <laughs> but I know that uh if he could run for re-election and he had to run against you, he'd be shaken in his boots. Oh, and I, don't I know have about that. never heard of all the Bill de Blasio stories, I've never heard the de Blasio porn studio story. Well, no, no. So no like, he people may come to the podcast <laughs> just for that. But, but as, as we conclude in this room, and then folks in the room will stick around and have some questions, uh, as we wrap the, the recording part of this, I just want to thank you for your leadership, for your tenacity, for your inspiration, for your personal example. You know, the, I've been very critical of this president for a number of reasons, and maybe most of all because of the tone he sets. And the example he sets for our children and every night in New York and in your columns and in everything you do on CNN and everywhere else, you set a very positive tone mm -hmm. for our country and a positive example for our city and for our children. That's how we you, get through it. You're a tremendous inspiration, and I'm grateful that you joined us here on Angry Americans. Thanks very Ladies much. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Errol All Lewis, right. live from Battery Park City in New York. Thank you.